Good evening, everybody. I am Marguerite Crespillo, and welcome to another awesome class. This time we're doing it in Real Estate 101. And this is a class that I've taught many times, not only in my Masterclass Real Estate Academy, uh, which many of you have access to, or you might find it on my YouTube channel, but we are recording this class tonight. So tonight we're gonna actually talk about the importance of how to create a seller's net sheet and why it is so vitally important that you do a net sheet. Really ideally, I recommend that you do these at the listing appointment. So, I mean, prior to the listing appointment, but you take them to your listing appointment. And the main reason you want to take them to a listing appointment is because you really want the seller to understand what the bottom line is, right? So frequently people are like, well, how much is a commission? How much is a commission? And what they don't take into consideration is that commission is just a part of the final closing costs and the total amount of money that is actually going to come out of the seller's pocket. And when you learn some of the tips and tricks and the checklist that I'm going to share with you guys tonight, you'll see that the best way to have this conversation is to really lump your commissions in with all of the costs that are associated with selling the home. Because frankly, the number one reason that you end up eating some of your commission and or reducing your commissions are because you did not adequately explain the costs to a seller upfront. Now, obviously, there are some guidelines and restrictions on specifically how much of a commission we can talk about because we can't actually specify what the actual commission is. But whatever you charge is completely up to you. And so let's dive into this and talk about why you should really prepare your own net sheets. I know that many of you rely on the title company to do it. And frankly, many of you wait until the last minute to even get the net sheet over to the seller, not even taking into consideration that this really should be part of the listing process, not just the closing process, right? Like you, we've talked many times about this fine line of trust and how trust works is that if I explain something to you up front, then guess what? You're going to say, oh yeah, when something happens, Marguerite warned me about that. But when I don't give you information up front, then guess what? When something goes wrong, they start thinking, well, what else did you not tell me? What else could possibly go wrong, right? And so the importance of really preparing your own net sheets is because your numbers are going to be way more accurate than what the title company will give you. The title company is simply going off what their general opinion is of what the costs are because they won't really provide an estimate until you get down to actually being in contract. This also helps prepare your seller for potential problems, which we're going to dive into in a few moments. And frankly, what I've discovered is that this preserves commissions. I know many of you are doing discounted options and reducing your commissions, or you're getting down to the wire and you're having to kick in some cash to close a deal. Now, again, what you charge is completely up to you. There's no guidelines or restrictions about that. But I can tell you that since I started doing this, Rarely, if ever, am I having to reduce my fees or kick in cash to close. What I will tell you is that if I screw up or I make a mistake, I write the check. And what I encourage you to do is that if you make a mistake or cause an issue to happen, that you write the check. But if you're up against me on another deal and the deal's not coming together because uh, your buyer was not prepared or you didn't explain something, I am not going to kick in part of my commission to help you out. And that's not trying to be mean or difficult. It's that when I make mistakes, I pay for it. If you make the mistake, I encourage you to pay for it. Because what I promise you is you'll only do it once, right? You're not going to make that same mistake again by uh, not preparing yourself or not discussing it in advance. So again, to me, the value is in the conversation. It's really the most important part that you can have. And when you are jumping the gun to reduce your fees or take a discount, many times that's because of lack of experience or lack of showing value. Because when you actually create value and you explain value, people are willing to pay, right? They don't really have an issue with it. So let's talk about this. Number one, I always use a checklist. And this is really a sample. Now, I will say that some of the fees and stuff are a little dated on here. I did this a while ago, so I do have an updated version. 
that I'll be posting in the group along with the video. But, and things and fees might change in your particular market. So you're going to kind of take this checklist and I'll send you one that's editable and you can actually update it for your own particular area, okay? So we're gonna dive into each of these areas and talk a little bit about it. Now, let's really break it down. I encourage you guys to really create a minimum of three different net sheets with different price ranges, okay? If you're going on a listing appointment and let's say the listing, you estimate that the house will be worth you know, 300,000, I would recommend that you do a net sheet in the 290, possibly 300 and 310. Of course, we're in an, in an insane market right now. So these numbers again might not apply, but I encourage you to create three different ranges so that you can really go over the numbers. <clears throat> the second thing I really encourage you to do is to always pull the tax record to get an idea of any outstanding loans or anything that could possibly be on there. Ideally, if you're having a conversation with them on the phone ahead of time, you're going to ask them, hey, what is your loan balance on your house, okay? Number three, uh, title fees. These vary greatly from company to company. So I really encourage you to obtain a few fee schedules. And again, this is gonna depend on your market, your area. I know some states are attorney states, meaning that they utilize attorneys in their market. So fees might be different. I do know that here in California, Northern California is different than Southern California. I have a transaction going on in SoCal right now and they have a separate escrow company and a separate title company where here in Northern California, it's one entity. It's title and escrow are all with the same company. So I encourage you guys again to go out and get a few different uh, fee schedules from the different title companies and or escrow companies so that you have an idea. I know several of the companies also have apps now where you can go and enter that information. I strongly encourage you guys to do these manually for a while, meaning physically write them down, go through and do them. Don't just use an app or don't just use an online program. I encourage you to get in the routine of creating them manually so you really understand all of the fees associated with selling a home and what that might look like to a seller. Okay, so line four on our checklist is escrow fees. Again, look closely at these as more and more banks, especially bank owned properties and other things are using out of area companies. So sometimes these sellers are utilizing title companies or escrow companies in Southern California or different areas, okay? Line five is gonna be all about brokerage fees. And again, what I encourage you to do is to break that out between the fee that is paid to the agent who represents the buyer and the fee that is paid to you as the listing agent, okay? Number six, line six on our checklist is notary fees. Watch out for traveling notaries. Many of them charge extra surcharges. Now, again, when I created this checklist a while ago, most of the time people were signing at the title and escrow companies. Well, now everything is done with mobile notaries. And they can charge anywhere from, I don't know, $150 to $200 I've seen or more depending on travel fees. So get to know again your title companies and what different kinds of fees they charge and what the average of those is. Okay, so line seven talks about recording fees. Again, pay attention to how many loans are on the property. Somebody might have a first and a second which means that there might be recording fees that might be in excess of what your average is. A lot of companies definitely have courier and FedEx fees. Uh, line nine are demand fees. How many loans are going to need demands? Now, I'm guessing that some of you may have never even heard of some of these fees or charges because you might not have ever even paid attention, right, to exactly what is on these net sheets. Now, again, I encourage you guys, if you have deals going right now, to start reviewing the net sheets that your sellers and your buyers are seeing. And I can't even tell you on probably 90% of the net sheets I review, I find a mistake. And guess what? When you find that mistake and you're able to point it out and save your client money, who's the hero, right? So important stuff. Okay, so the next one is... Uh, marketing fees. It's up to you whether you charge this or not. Some agents in some areas charge a marketing fee on the listing side. Home warranties. Have a, a 
packet of different home warranty brochures available. There are also websites now that give a list and a breakdown of all the different home warranty companies. I used to always just say, oh, home warranty is 300 bucks. And then I started realizing home warranties are no longer $300, right? They're now anywhere from five to $600 and can run excessively more depending on what uh, ad additions you add, like heat and air, um, you know, code violation things, add-ons. There's all kinds of add-ons, pool, uh, well and septics, things like that. So it's really important that you go through those brochures and you know really what they charge. The next one is transaction coordinator fee. Again, that can be anywhere from 300 to $350, $400. You'll know that whatever you charge in your particular market. Well inspection on a country property, a well and septic inspection are very, very typical. And many times the seller is paying that cost. Now, again, we are in an unusual market. This is being recorded here in March of 2021. And right now, many times the buyers are covering a lot of these expenses in multiple offer situations. But a well inspection can range anywhere from I've seen $600 to $1,000, which includes a couple different things. It includes what are called GPMs, gallons per minute, how many gallons per minute the well pumps. And how good that is depends a lot of times on the area. I've seen wells pump as low as one gallon per minute and be fine. Uh, our personal well on our house pumps 30 gallons per minute. So it can really vary from area to area. The next thing is what's called the septic inspection. Again, if you are in country property, this is where basically all the sewage goes. And septic inspections can range again, anywhere from 600 to $1,000 depending on if the septic tank has to be located or not, depending on how big it is, how long it's been since it was pumped. And if you'll notice in the purchase contracts, at least in California, they only talk about the septic inspection. They don't talk about the fact that it should be pumped. And I don't know about you, but if I'm moving into a new house, I want only my stuff going in that septic tank. I don't want anybody else's. So it's important that you make sure that you're including that in your costs, okay? Again, these, some of these are typically seller costs, not always. But what we want to do is we always want to estimate worst case scenario, right? We want to definitely tell people what they can expect. And then if they don't have to pay that bonus, that's extra money in their pocket, okay? So the next one talks about termite inspection and re-inspection. Now, one thing I want you guys to make sure you point out is when it comes to termite or pest report, whatever they call it, wood destroying organisms and pests in your market, make sure that you're clarifying to your buyer and seller that this does not cover things like ants or spiders. It really is only looking for wood destroying organisms. I can't tell you how many times uh, I've had a buyer or buyer's agent call and say, hey, there's ants in the house and I thought we had a pest report and they're not clear on what that covers. So these costs again, depend on areas, but I've seen them anywhere from $110 all the way up to 150 to 175. There is typically a termite inspection, original inspection cost and fee. And then there is a re-inspection if they're going to be issuing a clearance. So keep that in mind. Next, I talk about an estimate for termite repairs. I will typically put anywhere from $500 to $1,000 down on the net sheet. It does not mean that that's going to be required, asked for, or is even necessary. But again, we want to tell our sellers all the worst case scenarios that are going on, right? Roof inspection and certification. Again, check in your local area. I've seen these anywhere from $250 all the way to $1,000. And typically they will go out and inspect the roof and issue a certification, a two or three year certification or whatever is required. Again, you're gonna wanna add some potential roof repairs. Again, you guys, this does not mean that these are gonna be required items along with things like HVAC inspection, heat and air, chimney inspection. These are all possible or potential things. So can you see already just in, we're only part way through this, how many things you could have potentially missed that is now going to be asked for. And you could have a seller pretty upset if they didn't think about the fact that there could be 
thousands of dollars in some situations for pest repairs, roof repairs, different things like this. Okay. Now I've said this a few times now, it completely depends on your market. You're learning this in a market that's insane, but that doesn't mean that when you're here a couple of years from now, you're not going to say, oh yeah, I remember when we went through that and how vitally important this is. Next things to look at are things like natural hazards report. Typically in our market, they cost around $100 or so. Other things that could potentially come up are home inspection repairs. Again, I'll usually put $1,000 down just to give them an idea. Outstanding taxes and interest that might be due. These are things that are typically prorated at the close of escrow. But if you have a seller on a tight budget and now all of a sudden they have twelve to $1,500 in miscellaneous expenses that <clears throat> didn't come up, guess what, who they're gonna be looking at to cover those costs and expenses, okay? Um, outstanding taxes, again, this is something you might wanna be able to check with your local title company. Outstanding interest due. Some of you may or may not know this, but interest on your mortgage is paid in arrears. Meaning when you make your mortgage payment on April 1st, you're actually paying the interest for the month of March, okay? So when somebody makes a payment and we're gonna close at a certain time, they may have interest that is due on their mortgage, okay? Or they might even get a credit back on things like taxes, mortgage interest, uh, county, different things like that. So this time of year, for example, you guys might remember a test date, but county uh, property taxes, at least in California, are due on April 15th. And so a lot of times people are not necessarily paying attention to that, okay, or when those are actually due. County transfer taxes, it depends on your local county. I know that here in Placer County, it's a dollar ten per thousand. So depending on what county you're in, you're going to want to check a lot of this stuff. And if you are not familiar with the majority of these fees, I encourage you to go sit down and spend an hour with your title rep or somebody, an escrow officer, that can go over what a lot of the common fees are for your particular market and where you're located. Again, city, can city transfer tax, this could vary by city. And in a normal market, there might be things like costs that are being paid for by a buyer, okay? I mean, for the buyer on behalf of the seller. And people would say, well, who, what seller would pay buyer's closing costs? Well, again, in, in a different type of market, these were very common for us back in the day to get the seller to pay anywhere from three to 6% of the sales price towards a buyer's closing costs. Again, not something in this current market, but as things change, you guys will see some of these come to light. Things like on a VA no-no, on veteran loans, you're gonna, you may wanna try to get some fees paid for by the seller. Not possible really in this current market, but you never know. Uh, there used to be what are called FHA non-allowable fees. We don't really have those anymore. And drawing fees. So how does this break down? Well, let me give you a couple different scenarios. Wouldn't you love to have these sales prices right now? I know they still apply in some different states. But look at these two different scenarios and let's talk about how different these net sheets could be. For example, in scenario one, it's an FHA loan. We have a sales price of 225,000. We're asking the seller in this particular situation to pay title, escrow, city and county transfer tax and provide a termite clearance. Scenario two is a conventional loan. Sales price again, 225. They've asked us to split escrow and title, but they've asked the, the seller to pay 3% of the buyer's closing costs in sales price, and they're asking for a termite clearance. So do you think that there could be a significant difference in the bottom line to the seller? Absolutely, right? So let's look at it. These are two different net sheets. One is on the left, an FHA loan with a $100,000 payoff, uh, it has a first loan, a second loan, and you can see uh, prorations and adjustments, credit to the buyer for closing costs, commissions, termite repairs and credits, title and escrow fees, and a number of other things, which means the seller is going to net $69,278 in this particular scenario on scene one. On scenario two, in this scenario, again, this is where uh, they're paying 225 sales price, loan fees, 
uh, brokerage and commission fees, all these little breakdowns, right, of different things termite repairs, but they're not paying 3% of the sales price towards closing costs like this one. So they're actually going to net $66,406, right? This is a difference of $2,871. Pretty, pretty big difference for somebody, right? Now imagine if this was in a five, six or $700,000 price range, how that difference could be significant. And if your seller is estimating that they're going to get this 69,000 and they end up with 66,000, guess what? If you've not prepared them ahead of time, who are they gonna be looking to, to maybe cover the difference in those fees? Most likely you, okay? So big difference, does this make sense to all of you? So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now and see if you guys have any questions or thoughts about this net sheet that you'd like me to address. I do net sheets, but I've been using Fidelity. Mm -hmm. And so it always does, you know, it's pretty big where the commission shows up and there's always that, could you reduce that? You know, there's always that question. So I've got to get better about providing answers and maybe do my own net sheet. Are you doing the net sheets ahead of time? Are you taking them to your listing appointment? Yeah, so I don't print them out. I, I just do everything electronically. I At the listing appointment, I get all their information typically, like the loan balance, um, you know, what I've already gone ahead and did the work with the market analysis. So I kind of know where we're going to price it. And then I present it to them. And not every time. Sometimes they're just like, oh, that looks great, you know. But then other times they're looking at that condition. Oh, that's a big number. Is there any way you can reduce your side? So I do get that. On your last five appointments, have every single one of them asked you to reduce your fee? No, probably okay. one out of the five. So there you go. So I want to give you a scenario and I'm going to give you an, a, a situation where basically at a listing appointment, the agent volunteered to reduce their commission, right? Before it was ever even asked. And many, I've done that before. <laughs> and you guys, it's okay. This is no, there's no judgment in this. I'm not here to judge or criticize any of you. What I'm telling you is that you all work very hard for your money, right? And we do, and people don't think that we do, but look how many hours you may or may not have spent before you ever got paid. And so many times I don't actually address a particular commission amount or anything, I lump it all into one. I'll say, okay, Rachel, great. Let's go over the breakdown. And I want to mention you, Ramon, you told me that you owe 182,000 on your house. Is that correct? And, you know, many times they'll say, yes, it's about that. And I say, okay, well, let's overestimate because we want to overestimate what it's going to cost. So after we take the sales price, we deduct your loan and we, we, we deduct the costs of selling your home. You might remember Rachel, when you purchased a home, that you didn't have to pay many fees. Well, guess what? Those fees were paid by the seller. Well, guess who you are now? You're the seller, right? And so in this situation, this is the total amount of the closing cost. So after everything is said and done, you're going to walk away with about $70,000 that you can use towards the purchase of your new home. I don't break it down line by line. I go through and I say, these are the costs of selling. There's a fee that is paid to the agent who represents the buyer. There's a fee that is paid to me. There are things like title and escrow fees and city and county transfer taxes and inspection fees and a number of other things that are all the typical costs for a seller. Now, what I want to explain to you is that none of this really matters right now until we actually get offers on the table. And once we actually have offers on the table, I'm gonna prepare new net sheets for you based on those sales prices so that you can compare apples to apples. Does that make sense? So yeah. that's the way that's that nice. I explain it. I don't say, okay, it's 6% commission. It's $2,400 for this. It's $2,000 for that. It's 150. I don't break it down. I say, these are the total costs of selling. And so just keep in mind, we only get paid on results. So if we don't get your home sold for a price that is comfortable to you, then nobody gets paid. 
So that is typically how, because the average consumer has it in their head that they shouldn't pay 6% or maybe they've heard that from somebody. They don't even really know what 6% means. Like very few people actually sit and can, will calculate, oh, that's the fee, right? But they also don't understand what it's going to take for you to sell it. And so I lump it all together. I say, these are the costs of selling your home. And it's really broken down here on this net sheet that I'm giving to you. But part of it goes to the agent who brings the buyer and part of it goes to me. Because a lot of sellers also think that if it's 6%, you're getting all of it. I mean, I literally had a lender who didn't understand that he referred me a client. He's a broker, referred me a client and he thought I got 6%. I was like, you're a lender. You've been around a while. That's not, no, that's not how it works, right? And so many people don't really understand it. And so when you, the minute you say 6%, they know that you shouldn't, that they can get a discount many times. So I never even talk about the percentage. I say, these are the costs of selling your home. And Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you remember when you bought a home, you didn't have to pay all these fees, but now you're the seller. And so when you go buy a home, guess what? The seller is paying the same type of fees that you're having to pay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. I think maybe if I use a different net sheet and you're right, get rid of the percentage term and just put the costs in there. That might, that might help me. So let me go back I'm gonna try that. Show you guys, let me go back here and show you guys. Um, this is not necessarily the one that I use in front of a client but this is the checklist I use to create it, okay? And then I actually take and put all the examples, as you can see, these are some dated examples, but I put, the, I put all of this in your car forms or whatever your guys' state forms are. There is what's called an estimated seller's net sheet in there. And I utilize the one that is actually in car forms. I never use the one from the title company. I never do. Now, what I will do is that when I get down to the wire and my seller is getting ready to go sign, I will always request the net sheet for both the buyer or the seller and make sure that we didn't miss anything and that all the numbers are correct. I just caught one today where the buyers had agreed to pay for title and escrow, but yet on the net sheet, it showed the seller paying. So that was about a $3,000 mistake to my client that I caught. So guess what? When I go to my client and I say, hey, I just found, you know, $3,000 error in your favor, they're happy. Now, do I find errors in the opposite? Yes. But the reality is, is that, you know, you always want to prepare your client for the worst case scenario. So again, when it comes time, I'm going to make sure, and we have offers, this is how I can actually compare apples to apples by taking them two to three different net sheets based on the offers at hand. Because this is a big difference for a seller, right? $3,000, almost $3,000 difference between offers where the original offer might have looked like a better offer. So you just never really understand. They're both at the sales price and many times sellers will focus on sales price. They don't focus on all these little costs that are broken down. So that's why it's so important that you explain it to them up front and that they completely understand it. All right, do you guys have any other questions or any thoughts? It was a great class, thank you. You're welcome. So this is recorded, obviously. It'll be edited and posted in our group tomorrow along with the uh, sample checklist that you guys can print out. And I really encourage you to play with this a bit before you're actually on stage in front of a client, right? Is do some examples of different net sheets in different scenarios so that you can be prepared and completely understand all the different things that could potentially come up. And you may have different things for your market or your area that you may want to add to it. All right, any other questions before we wrap up? Do you also recommend um, a net sheet for your buyers? So you can't necessarily do a net sheet upfront for a buyer. But what I do recommend is that you explain if any of you guys have been through my buyer presentation, I do have it posted in our, um, our EXP family group. And it's also available inside of real estate success strategies and accountability groups. So I have my, it's one I did many years ago, but it still applies today. 
And I always want to break down closing costs for a buyer between two different types of closing costs. There are the real estate costs associated with the purchase contract, things like title and escrow, home warranty, city county transfer tax. And then there's the loan fees. And many times buyers get confused because maybe you wrote a purchase contract and you say, hey, we got the seller to pay all your closing costs, right? And they think it's all the closing costs. They don't understand that that's not the loan fees also. Okay. And so many times I will explain, Hey, Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, I want to explain to you, there are two types of closing costs. There are the co closing costs associated with the purchase of the home. And there are the closing costs associated with the loan that you're getting. You want to make sure that you go over all of those loan fees with your lender and get a breakdown. So you know exactly what they are, because there's nothing worse than getting all the way to closing. And a buyer didn't understand that they were going to have to pay two to 3% of the sales price in closing costs and they're not prepared for it. Hopefully your lender has prepared them. But you guys, I assume always with my buyer and seller that no one else is gonna do their job, right? Now I work with great lenders. I'm sure all of you do as well and great title and escrow people, but assume that maybe they are not working with your lender and assume that maybe your lender did not go over and explain and the breakdown of those costs to your client. So that's, again, a, a conversation you want to have in your upfront buyer conversation about the actual breakdown and the difference between real estate closing costs and the loan closing costs, okay? Does that answer your question, Claudia? Fantastic. All right, any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you for joining me and have a fantastic night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.